This is a response to this video and this one. The latter contains some of the material from the first with additional material and interpretations. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the first one because that's the first one I watched. These videos are by Malcolm Bowden. Bowden is a geocentrist, which means he believes that the Earth is the center of the universe. He believes this because it fits in with his interpretation of the Bible. He is also, as you can imagine, a young Earth creationist. Although Bowden is out there on the fringe with his geocentrism, the alleged showing, slowing of the speed of light that he talks about has been taken up by other creationists and is therefore important to look at. His video has a number of graphs that he uses to prove his points. When I first saw these graphs, I was excited. I mean, data, graphs, maybe I can replot the points, do a linear regression. And then I looked at the graph. <sighs> Instead, I'm stuck with this numbskull. Oh well, someday my data will come. So let's look at his first graph. Not too clear, but I had to take it from his video. I couldn't find a copy of it online. Now, it certainly looks like the speed of light has been decreasing, according to the graph. Although it also seems that the speed of light has stabilized recently, which might disrupt his theory. I mean, why, if the speed of light has been slowing down since the beginning of time, would it stop slowing now? He gives no explanation for that. Now, there are these older dates that seem far off the more recent ones, and given that the time that they were measured, it seems likely that the abilities of researchers back then weren't as great, so I would tend to discount these. Now, he answers critics who mentions that the older data might not be accurate with another graph, and this is in the, the second video. But that's not really important, and I think you'll see why. Now, on this graph, he says, for enlargement C, well, let's see. Here's the enlarged section. Now, I'm sure that some people out there might already see problems with this graph, but bear with me. I want to just take a look at it as if I, I weren't really that familiar with looking at graphs, just to look at what I see. Okay, now the vertical lines, by the way, uh, that radiate out from each point illustrate the experimenter's uh, estimate of uncertainty. And when I looked this up, I found out that sometimes the uncertainty was, was estimated by the experimenters themselves, and sometimes it's unclear why they chose that uncertainty. That's okay, we'll accept it. So what that means is the actual speed of light could be at anywhere in that line, not just at that the center point where the points are, okay? So the first thing I want to do is to put the re re line representing the current speed of light in red. Then I want to look at the data points. Now, these data points represent different measurements of the speed of light by different people at different times. So I put a green outline here, you can see, around the points that are very close to the current speed. There are also, as you can tell, uh, points that were measured fairly recently. Now, inside this box is a yellow box, and it, it shows a cluster uh, of points below the speed, and you know, those you might want to look at. I then circled in purple some points that are further off, and in the upper left, there are some outlined in pink that are way off. Now, each of those normally would deserve attention. But then I look at Michelson's data, and these are in blue. And you can see there are several data points from Michelson. And you'll notice that the results that Michelson gets, gets closer to the current speed of light as he continues to experiment. And without even knowing anything else, this would suggest to me that Michelson's methodology improves with time, he gets better at reckoning the speed of light the more he does it. Maybe those older data points in purple and pink, then, are less accurate because of the way the experiments were done or the data analyzed. So far, all I've done is look at the graph. Next, I did some research into the history of computing the speed of light. For the moment, let's go back to the original graph, but this time with the current speed of light in red. Now, as I was researching this, I came across two very important gentlemen, Fizeau and Foucault. Uh, and these two gentlemen designed an apparatus for the measurement of the speed of light. And they were, um, they were contemporaries, and they, were, they competed with each other. But they designed an apparatus, they said, to, to measure the speed of light. And here's a, a diagram of the original apparatus. It doesn't really help much, does it? But I thought you might like to see it. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow from Wikipedia because I did do the research and they've got some good stuff in there. So here's a diagram of the Fizeau-Foucault uh, apparatus. 
as you can see here, the, it says the light passes on one side of a tooth on the way out and the other side on the way back, assuming the cog rotates one tooth during the transit of light. Okay, so what that means is they've got a, like a gear that's moving at a steady speed and they've got a light beam shooting past the top of the gear and it goes on one side of the gear of a tooth of the gear on the way out then it bounces back goes on the other side and because you know the speed at which the gear rotates you can compute the speed of light and there are a lot of places on the web where, where you can actually do this that it will show you the the data and and how they did it and everything so and you can look at Wikipedia uh, for more data and I'm gonna have some uh, resources below that you can look at now Fizeau in 1849 got a measurement of 313,300 kilometers per second with the speed of light and Foucault in 1862 got a measurement of 298,000 kilometers per second for the speed of light but if you go back to the graph and look for these points um, at 1849 and 1862 you'll, you'll notice they're missing they should be somewhere in these orange shaded areas so why would Bowden leave these out? These are pivotal, pivotal observations. And the device used by Fizeau and Foucault would be the pattern of such inquiries for years to come. As a matter of fact, it, Michelson's uh, apparatus was based on the Fizeau-Foucault uh, you know, design. And, well, there's a very good reason he left them out, and you can see that right here. As you can see, Fizeau's calculation of 313,000 kilometers per second would be way off the top of the chart. The graph only goes up to 300,750 kilometers per second. And Foucault's calculation of 298,000 is off the graph in the other direction. To give you an idea of how far, I put a yellow box around 300,000 kilometers per second and another approximately where 299,000 kilometers per second would be. Foucault's measurement would be that distance again below the 299,000 mark. So the conclusion is simple. He left these points off because it would have screwed up his lovely curve. So if these points are missing, you know, what about some of the points that actually are there? So I checked the measurements that Brad Bradley and Lindenau did. Those are the two at the upper left of the chart. What I found is both were misplotted. Bradley's actual measurement was 301,000 kilometers per second, and it would be off the chart. Lindenau's was 300,460, and it would be lower than the actual point shown, kind of sitting on that, that line there. It's not as far off as Bradley's, but still. So now we have two critical pivotal points left off of the graph, and two misplotted. The credibility of this graph is fading fast. There's one more thing. When I researched Fizeau and Foucault, it was mentioned how close to the actual speed of light they got. But it doesn't look like that, does it? I mean, one is way off the graph at the top, and the other is way off the graph on the bottom. So I decided to look at the actual figures as compared to the current accepted value for the speed of light. And here they are. And I then did the math and found that Fizeau's figure was off by only 4% of the current value and Foucault's was even closer at being 0.6% off. But looking back at the graph it doesn't seem like they're that close. Well we find the answer by looking at the y-axis. What's happened here is that Bowden carefully chose his y-axis in such a way as to exaggerate the differences between these points. If Fizeau was off by 4% and Foucault was off by 0.6%, then you can see that even Bradley and Lindenau's points are far closer than they look. So in summary, we have a graph that omits key points, misplots others, is exaggerated to show differences that aren't really very great. In other words, it is a fraud, a big fraud. And of course, there's no explanation as to why the speed of light has now suddenly stabilized in the modern era at just about the time the researchers get better at measuring it. But let's go back for a minute and look at the original graph. Now I've uh, exaggerated the curve here in red to make it real obvious. 
It looks good, doesn't it? Convincing. This is the problem. People who don't know what they're looking at, don't know how to look at a graph, will believe something like this. It seems authentic. The state of education in math and science in this country is abominable. I'm afraid far too many people are taken in by this kind of claptrap, especially when they have motive to believe. The motive? Well, sadly, it boils down to believe in creation or you will burn in the fiery depths of hell. It's a disgusting tactic and an unnecessary one. Many, if not most, creationists in this country are fundamentalist Christians. Accepting current scientific information challenges the creation account in Genesis. So therefore, science must be wrong. Worse, to believe in science then necessitates disbelief in Genesis, which means, yep, hell. So they have to try to destroy science. As you can see here, it's not just the theory of evolution they're after, but physics and chemistry and cosmology and... Apparently lying for Jesus is okay. And I wonder what Jesus really would think of that. Now, most mainstream religions have no problem with religion. I'm going to link this page you see here, and it's from the National Center for Science Education. And um, it has a, a lot of links there where, where you can go and see what various different religions and religious uh, people actually think about uh, evolution. So why change the speed of light? If the speed of light were faster in the past, then apparently according to Bowden, radioactivity was faster in the past. Thus, radiometric dating results are false. So he applies this corrective factor called the CDK factor um, that reduces the billions of years down to a few thousand. If the Earth is only a few thousand years old, then the biblical account of creation could be true. So possibly people could even have lived with dinosaurs. Of course, the, this speculation is based on, well, fraudulent data. This isn't the first time I talked about creationist tomfoolery. In the last part of my video, Creationism versus Comprehension, I show this chart from Answers in Genesis, and it's still there, that purports to show erroneous argon dates for rocks from recent volcanic eruptions. Recent in geological terms, that is. They cite their source as Dalrymple. Well, I obtained a copy of Dalrymple's paper and found the original chart, then compared it with the Answers in Genesis table. And here you can see I have the table from Answers in Genesis on the top left and Dalrymple's original chart on the right. And I have connected the data uh, between the two using red lines and, and outlines. The problem is that the age that Answers in Genesis reports as supposedly obtained from Dalrymple's paper isn't the age Dalrymple got at all. It's the quantity of material measured. They copied from the wrong column Dalrymple's chart. They copied from the quantity column, not the age column, but then they listed it as the age. Now, how can you trust people who don't even check the data that they're reporting? This wouldn't happen in a respectable scientific publication. If something were, was reported incorrectly, hordes of scientists would be noticed and start raising the alarm. But this wrong information just keeps getting passed around from creationist to creationist with apparently no one bothering to check the facts. See for yourself. And I said, I'll link the answers to a Genesis page as well, but you can easily search for this information. Um, I had to buy the Dalrymple paper, so I'm afraid you're going to have to take my word for it unless you find it for yourself or buy it for yourself. But I did print the graph right there. Uh, and it's not that hard to find this information, so there's really no excuse for creationists to be so stupid. Now, earlier I said that someday my data will come. Well, it's coming. As a matter of fact, it's in the mail. As I was preparing this, I continued to search on the Internet for more information on this subject. But one thing, I wanted to make sure I had the correct data. Sadly, the Internet is a place where false information proliferates, so you need to check and double-check what you're reading there. I took my information from sites that I had confidence in, such as university web pages. To give you an example, some places list Fizeau's calculation as 315,000 kilometers per second, not as 313,000 kilometers per second. I also found a couple of uh, places that actually listed Foucault's measurement as what is actually the speed of light today. So I assume these are copying errors somewhere. 
Now, in, in checking this out, I found this Skulls and Stars blog. Skulls in the Stars, excuse me. Skulls in the Stars tracked down Fizeau's original paper in French. And I'm showing you the beginning of it here, as well as the Skulls in the Stars logo. And uh, Skulls in the Stars then goes on to explain the paper in another post. I'll list the links below. And the author of Skulls in the Stars in a, is an associate professor of physics specializing in optical science at UNC Charlotte. I consider this a good source, especially since the references are given and displayed. Now, as I continued to look, I found where Bowden got his information. Now, this was before I saw the second vis video, which mentioned Setterfield. But he gets it from a man named Barry Setterfield, who has a place called Genesis Science Research. Now, Setterfield in his bio mentions that his life was changed when he was given the book Mysterious Universe, a handbook of astronomical anomalies, written by William Corliss in 1979. William Roger Corliss is legitimate. Corliss was a physicist who was interested in anomalies. He had been fascinated by Charles Fort, who had collected reports of unusual phenomena and published them. Unlike Fort, who collected his information from various sources, Corliss used actual scientific papers and journals. And he published a number of books in various fields with his collected information, including Mysterious Universe. Well, I found a used copy and I bought it. It's being shipped to me. And once I have it, I'll read it. And I'll compare it to uh, Setterfield's paper, which is on the internet, as well as to current information. Now, this book was published in 1979. And a lot has changed since then. Perhaps some of Corliss anomalies have been explained by now. So I'll have the data to analyze and graphing to do. And that makes me happy. I know, I can just hear the face palms out there. In a few weeks, uh, I mean, I do have other things to do. I hope to have the results of my investigation. In the meantime, thanks for watching.